Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the National Constitution Center and to today's convening of America's Town Hall. I am Jeffrey Rosen, the president and CEO of this wonderful institution. And let us uh, inspire ourselves for the learning and conversation ahead by reciting together the National Constitution Center's mission statement. Here we go. The National Constitution Center is the only institution in America chartered by Congress to increase awareness and understanding of the US Constitution among the American people on a nonpartisan basis. Before we begin, I want to share my excitement about some upcoming town halls in May. Next week on May 5th, we host a discussion with my dear law school teacher and mentor and one of America's greatest constitutional scholars, Akhil Ridamar, about his new path-breaking book, The Words That Made Us, America's Constitutional Conversation, 1760 to 1840, it is a transformative constitutional history, and I can't wait to share its light with you. On May 12th, we host a discussion of American literature in the Constitution with a wonderful group of scholars, including Bernadette Myler of Stanford, Alison LaCroix of Chicago, and the political scientist Catherine Zuckert of Notre Dame, uh, whose book on uh, natural law and American literature I've just been reading with great profit and I'm eager for you to uh, experience that as well. And then on May 20th, uh, right before the anniversary of the start of the Constitutional Convention on May 25th, we are going to launch our new initiative of the Founders Library. Friends, I'm so excited that the Constitutional Center is going to put online all of the great primary texts of American constitutional history, beginning in the classical era and moving through the second founding, the founding and the civil rights era, and we discuss those texts with a great group of scholars. I'll resist the urge to plug more. There's much more coming up and you can find it at constitutioncenter.org forward slash debate. We'll be taking your questions throughout the program today. So please put them in the Q&A box and I'll introduce them um, as, as I can. And I would like to thank uh, Don McCree and Dan Fitzpatrick of Citizens, our friends and long, uh, longtime corporate partners for their uh, support of this program and their continued investment in constitutional education and generous support. I will now introduce our remarkable group of panelists. I'm so honored to convene uh, these uh, scholars and thought leaders, and then we'll get right into our very important discussion. Do we need a third reconstruction? William Allen is Emeritus Professor of Political Philosophy at Michigan State University and Emeritus Dean at MSU's James Madison College. He is the author uh, of many books, including Rethinking Uncle Tom, The Political Philosophy of Harriet Beecher Stowe, George Washington, America's First Progressive, and Let the Advice Be Good, a Defense of Madison's Democratic Nationalism, among others. Wilfred Cottington III is an assistant professor of law at Brooklyn Law School and a Brennan Center fellow. He is the author of the article in the Atlantic National Constitution Center's uh, joint uh, website, The Battle for the Constitution, that inspired today's panel, uh, Why We Need a Third Reconstruction. And he's also the co-author of the forthcoming book, The People's Constitution, 200 Years, 27 Amendments, and the Promise of a More Perfect Union, which I'm excited to share with you uh, in the fall, because I've just been hearing about it, and it sounds great. Sherilyn Eiffel is the president and director counsel of the NAACP Legal Defense and Education Fund. I'm honored that she's also a former board member of the National Constitution Center. She uh, is the author of the highly acclaimed book On the Courthouse Lawn, Confronting the Legacy of Lynching in the 21st Century. She uh, is uh, one of America's most distinguished uh, advocates for uh, equal rights and began her career as a fellow with the American Civil Liberties Union before joining the staff of the LDF as assistant counsel in 1988. Uh, and Kurt Lash is the E. Claiborne Robbins Distinguished Chair in Law and the founder and director of the Richmond Program on the American Constitution at the University of Richmond School of Law. He's published widely on the 14th Amendment and uh, is the author of the new volume, The Reconstruction Amendments, Essential Documents, and uh, Professor Lash worked with the Constitution Center to put some of those essential documents online on the interactive Constitution. Uh, it is a great honor to welcome all of you, and I'm going to jump right in with you, Professor Codrington. Your important article in The Atlantic, Why We Need a Third Reconstruction, has provoked and inspired a national conversation on the topic 
In that piece, you argue clearly that uh, you believe that both the first and second reconstructions uh, failed in, in different ways to achieve their promise, and we need a, and we need a third. Uh, tell us uh, more about the thesis of your article and what a third reconstruction would look like. Sure. Yeah. So thank you for having me. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here. Um, so the idea of the reconstruction um, started in the wake of the Civil War, right? So we have this period um, in the 1860s through the late 1870s, uh, where you have this new promise of equality and uh, liberty for all, where you have the abolition of slavery in the 13th Amendment, uh, the promise of equal citizenship, protection of due, right, due process rights, um, and, and all the things we kind of think of as the incidents of citizenship. And of course, the 15th Amendment with the uh, anti-discrimination provision uh, enfranchising Black men in voting. Um, and then you have with it a, a range of other legislation, your civil rights acts of those eras, the enforcement acts of those eras to make sure that these, these actual new protections and freedoms are actually guaranteed and enforced. Um, and this lasted about a dozen years, uh, but then you just have this convergence of events. You have economic downturn, you have a uh, political scandal, and you basically have uh, white America sort of just exhausted, racial exhaustion as one scholar calls it. Um, um, just the weariness that, you know, in this dozen years, black people aren't doing enough to actually um, um, show that they earned and deserve citizenship. Um, and, and that leads to um, this period of Jim Crow, uh, America's racial apartheid that lasts for decades into the middle of the next century. Um, in the middle of the next century, you have another period, the civil rights era, where uh, just movements, again, sort of following in the same way that the abolitionist movement pushed the first era of reconstruction, you have um, movements pushing for this second era of reconstruction. So you get uh, some uh, critical constitutional amendments, but even more important legislation um, in Congress. So you get the Civil Rights Act of 64, you get the Voting Rights Act of 65, you get the Fair Housing Acts of 68, and you have these uh, groundbreaking Supreme Court decisions. So you have Brown v. Board in 1954, of course, but then a bunch of uh, cases where the Supreme Court is protecting criminal defendants' rights and getting rid of vote dilution where um, urban and cities are basically um, afforded way less uh, vote than rural areas in your one person, one vote cases. And you also have the Great Society um, adding an economic heft to this. And, and so you basically get this second era where you have this vision and this promise of equality and you see substantial gains in Black America and America generally. Um, and, and, and just like the uh, first reconstruction, you see that, area, that era also spiral. So you have white flight occurring in the cities. Um, you, you have... Um, the courts being packed with conservatives. Uh, Nixon gets a point four in a matter of five years. You have this movement conservatism, which is really a backlash to all the progress made in the civil rights era. And this just lasts decades. And, and some might say that this is still occurring right now. Um, and so what I'm arguing for is we need a third period of reconstruction. We need something that parallels the first two in terms of its vision, and its promise, but we really need to take the baton over the finish line this time. Because what we see right now, and particularly in this era of COVID, is that Black people, Brown people, Indigenous communities um, have suffered the bulk of all the, the burdens we're seeing. We're seeing it in the economy. We've seen it uh, in, in healthcare. So COVID has just uh, follow the path that has existed structurally over the past 50 years. Um, and we see it unfortunately in the spate of violence against black and brown people, both vigilante violence, 
uh, by extrajudicial killings and police violence. And, and, and so at this time where we are having this real moment of uh, racial uh, reckoning, it is the time that we actually fulfill the promise of those prior to reconstructions that weren't able to get the job done. Thank you very much for that uh, powerful summary of your important article. Uh, Professor Allen, Professor Coddington uh, just told us that both of the first two reconstructions combined constitutional amendments with landmark federal statutes. And he thinks a third reconstruction is necessary. And in his article, as he just said, he said a third reconstruction uh, begins with sweeping criminal justice and voting reforms. It might also entail direct investments in black communities to guarantee stable housing, universal health care, high quality education and greater wealth parity. And it also would uh, require truth, reconciliation and recompense. Uh, and, and he concludes by saying, and finally on colorblindness, acknowledging race is necessary, identifying its impact is necessary. Uh, do you agree or disagree with Professor Coddington's argument? Well, let me say that whether there's a third or a 37th or 377th reconstruction seems to me to be not a subject of debate one way or the other, because it's the original reconstruction that ought to be framing our understanding. And typically in the academic tradition, we have referred to reconstruction in, a, in an inverted image of what actually transpired. We, it was a point of policy intervention rather than itself an expression of social or political dynamics. And therefore, it's not surprising that there are twists and turns to the whole conversation about reconstruction because it's taking place in a greater context of political and social dynamics, going all the way back, in fact, to the beginning of the Republic. Uh, the, the latest uh, work by uh, Kate Mazur on America's forgotten civil rights movement makes it very clear to us that there is a broader context in which we ought to be seeing this, a context that begins with Prince Hall, for example, or Benjamin Banneker or Richard Allen. That, that was a civil rights movement properly understood, as it was a civil rights movement that ought to be understood as occurring prior to the Civil War, and which actually frames the issues that Reconstruction was meant to address, which means that Reconstruction doesn't emerge out of the conclusion of the war, it emerges in reaction to processes that were in play before the war even began. And those processes were triggered in 1842 in Prigg versus Pennsylvania, when Justice Taney dissented from a case he otherwise agreed with, but he dissented to make one powerful argument, which is the entire story ever after of the struggles over reconstruction or not. And that is that there should be no federal control over the state decisions about the presence of people of differing races within the states. That's why he dissented from a decision he agreed with. And it was the carrying out of his principle in that that we saw realized in Dred Scott versus Tony. And more importantly, it was the carrying out of that principle that led people of the period leading up to the Civil War, as in Oregon, when it petitioned to become a state, to write into their constitutions provisions barring the entry of free black people. Now, there was at that time a powerful civil rights movement that overcame that and overcame it in the post-Civil War period with the amendments to be sure, but even prior to that was expressed in the new Republican Party, which was animated by a privileges and immunities claim that it extended to black people in general and fought for. So what we're actually seeing is not a succession of reconstructions, but the continuation of the battle for equal privileges and immunities. And that doesn't have a number to attach to it because it can't end until it ends in comprehensive success. And it will always be the first and only privileges and equal privileges and immunities revolution. Everything else is just a stopping point along the way to that accomplishment. Thank you very much for that. Uh, Cheryl and Eiffel, what do you make of Professor Allen's uh, powerful suggestion that rather than thinking about separate reconstructions, we should think about fulfilling the promise of the first one, which as he, he just argued began not after the Civil War, but as early as Prince Hall's petition to the uh, Massachusetts legislature. Uh, and uh, after sharing your thoughts on, on that, tell us that if we were to have another reconstruction, whether we consider it a, a third one or a continuation of the first, what would it look like? You, you've been writing very powerfully recently about the need for police reform, among other things, which would involve a combination of 
federal and state uh, reforms, as well as rethinking uh, a colorblind approach to criminal justice enforcement. If there were to be another reconstruction, what would it look like? Thanks so much, uh, Jeffrey, and thank you for having me as part of this of this session and for the great work that the National Constitution Center does. Um, I, I haven't heard it put quite like Professor Allen did, but it it actually resonates quite powerfully for me because, um, you know, I, I was actually thinking about and trying to think through how to talk about um, the seeds that are planted that lead to what we think of as these moments, right? Even if we think about the civil rights movement, which we think of as being kind of, you know, bounded by, by several events, maybe beginning with Brown versus Board of Education in 1954 and ending with the Fair Housing Act of 1968 and the assassination of, of Martin Luther King. That's a very bounded period. But what is happening in the 10 years before 1954 are actually part of the civil rights movement, or at least have to be regarded as part of the civil rights movement in the same way that Professor Allen talks about uh, reconstruction and what those seeds are. So even if I'm willing to accept the reconstruction framing, I agree that we have to think more expansively about what actually constitutes a reconstruction because there's a part of it that is about the documents, that's about the constitution itself, about the actual amendments. But there also is a part of it that is about the people and the activism uh, and the demand that actually creates the context in which the documents change. We can see that most read readily in the second reconstruction, right? In the civil rights movement, in which there is, it's essentially the people's reconstruction. Uh, and it is, it is a force of, of people speaking about what they believe citizenship must mean that compels uh, the change in, in, in so many of our laws that compels Congress after a hundred year dormancy of failing to use the enforcement power that the framers of the 14th and 15th amendments expressly put in the amendments for Congress to use and Congress basically sat on the power, uh, it, it forcing them to use that power. Uh, but what comes before that? What comes before that is um, a lot of events, but I wanna just note one because I think it's relevant for this third reconstruction, which I agree uh, is upon us. And I think we're actually in it. And I think um, it's important for us to recognize these events because they're not all events that involve people making a petition or government officials thinking about how they wanna reshape government. There are other intangible events that most of us are not in control of that powerfully set the stage for transformation in a democracy. And I share this with our attorneys all the time. World War II was one of those. World War II was a powerful event that changed the narrative about our country, that reshaped a narrative about who we are that suggested a narrative to black people, particularly those black men who served in World War II about who they needed to be as citizens when they returned. It weakened a set of arguments about, about black second-class citizenship. It created confrontations in the South between returning black soldiers and those who were devoted to white supremacy. And it essentially turned over the soil in a way that set the stage. It also had a powerful effect on the president of the country, President Truman, who, um, not the, a perfect president, but had one particular quality that was powerfully important to, to undergirding the beginnings of the civil rights movement. And that was that he had a real problem with racial discrimination against service people. We know what he did in the executive order in integrating the military, but there are other things he did as well. One of them is described in the new book by uh, Judge Gergel, Unexampled Courage, was his outrage at the blinding of Isaac Woodard, a sergeant who returned home from the war, uh, blinded by a Southern sheriff in Aiken, South Carolina, uh, and Truman's absolute outrage and speaking out about that case. Uh, he also compelled the FBI to investigate a quadruple lynching in Georgia because one of the people who were lynched was a former service person. And then he did one other thing, which I'm actually writing about, which is that he uh, insisted and intervened in a case in Iowa, Sioux City, Iowa, in which a returning service person was not allowed to be buried in the Sioux City Memorial Park because he was Native American. And Truman intervened and insisted that they come to Arlington National Cemetery and that he be buried there. Uh, and he was outraged by that. So you had a president 
who had a sense that something about service and service in the war meant something very particular about who Black people were. You had Black people's own sense of what it meant to have served. You had a narrative about fighting Nazism abroad uh, and this idea of equality that also then was refurbished and so the soil was tilled. I say that's important because those are the events that cabin the other events that are happening. Obviously, there is a strategic plan to quote unquote, break the black back of Jim Crow, which Charles Hamilton Houston and Thurgood Marshall are working on. Their first success is in 1935 in their case successfully challenging segregation at University of Maryland Law School. Uh, it culminates in Brown, but that's 20 years, 35 to 54-ish uh, is 20 years of them working that strategy. And I raise all of that because it allows us to reflect on the moment that we're in right now, where, as, as, as William appropriately says, we do need this third reconstruction. It's not even a question for me. It's just how we're going to do it. So we need, we need boldness. We need the documentary change. But let's be clear about what has been happening. I think it begins uh, very much with, with the unrest in Ferguson. Um, I think it begins, again, with people having a conversation themselves about what citizenship and equality means and forcing that conversation on the broader body politic. And we've been in that conversation since 2014. We also have had a catastrophic event similar to World War II, and that's COVID-19. And the pandemic has had a powerful effect on how many people, and particularly Black people and other people of color, think about themselves as citizens, think about their rights in this republic, think about the relationship between the federal government and the state. And while we are in this retrenched period, and, and I should add, so we've had the COVID-19 pandemic, but we've also had what I am unashamed to say, despite being in a nonpartisan environment, because I don't think this is partisan, a catastrophic threat to our democracy over the last four years, culminating in January 6th, which demonstrated that there are a powerful anti-democratic forces in our country that threaten the core of the Republic, regardless of our disagreements with each other along various partisan lines, that the core of our Republic is threatened and that we had a narrow miss from going over the cliff. Those two catastrophic events are pushing and compelling a set of conversations and a, and a boldness about engaging with our foundational documents, about engaging with our laws that suggest to people the need for radical transformation uh, in a way that we have not seen in some time. And so I think, yes, we are ready for that third reconstruction. And when we embark on it, Jeff, I think we're gonna have to begin to take up some of the issues that we have left to the side. Some of them are about voting inequality. Some of them are about the physical landscape of this country, which itself was created based on policies and practices deeply steeped in racial discrimination and segregation. It accounts for why we are physically separated from one another. And it is time for us to confront that physical separation and think about how we can Im implement government policies that were as powerful as the interstate highway system and the GI Bill in creating the white suburbs of the 1950s and 1960s that became so much a part of our thinking because of all the television programs that showed them to us. We need a similar imaginative investment that will dismantle that physical infrastructure that keeps us separated from one another. So that's just one aspect of it, but I think we have our work cut out for us, but the forces that have been uh, raging around us have forced us to a moment of radical reimagining. Thank you very much for that. Uh, Professor Lash, you just heard Cheryl and Eiffel say, give, give us a powerful definition of what a, third reconstruction would look like. She said it would involve a bold conversation about equality, citizenship, and a relationship between federal and state government and the nature of our democratic institutions, leading to a radical transformation of laws and government practices about voting inequality, as well as dismantling physical separation of white and black citizens. I thought it was helpful to restate because it's such a, a clear uh, definition. Uh, do you agree that that um, is a definition of what a reconstruction would look like, whether we consider it a third or a continuation of the first? And what has your study of the primary sources of the first reconstruction, which you so generously allowed the National Constitution Center to put online and which you collect in your new book, taught you about what a reconstruction looks like and when we can say that it occurred? I think you may be muted. There. there we go. Great. It's, a, it's a pleasure to be here, Jeff. Thank you for, um, for bringing me on. And, and 
such a pleasure to listen to these wonderful, wonderful comments and analyses of, of the situation we're in. Sherilyn's account of um, how events drive extraordinary moments of, um, of advances in, in, um, in individual rights and freedoms. I think that's, that's exactly correct and it's borne out in history. Um, you know, Williams talk about how there's a continuity, how nothing springs from nowhere at all. It's rooted in debates and sacrifices that came before the moment of change. And, and, and Wilfred's comment about how a lot of those moments of change during the, um, the second reconstruction, civil, the civil rights era, how so much of that involves statutes, right? Um, statutes and Supreme Court cases that drove the conversation and drove a lot of, a lot of the developments. This is all um, wonderful and I think it, it, it fits together. I suppose what I'd like to do is, is say a little bit, and, the, and this is what you've invited me to do, say a little bit about um, the first reconstruction because it's a little different from the um, from the second reconstruction during the civil rights era, and also a little different from what Cheryl Lynn, I think, is um, has just recommended. The first the first reconstruction was a constitutional uh, reconstruction, not a statutory um, or political realignment. It was a constitutional reconstruction, and and Williams exactly right. It didn't come it didn't come out of nowhere. It was in in a lot of ways it kind of represented the country's answer to Frederick Douglass's question: Is the Constitution pro slavery? Um, or anti-slavery. That was the, the question that had torn the nation apart in the decades prior to the Civil War. And you had slaveholding states insisting that Northern states were denying them their constitutional right to hold men as property. You had Northern abolitionists, on the other hand, insisting that slaveholding states were denying the enslaved their constitutional rights and their fundamental rights to life, liberty, and, and property. And you had some, you actually had some abolitionists in the North, like William Lloyd Garrison, who were far more radical, and they condemned the Constitution as irredeemably pro-slavery and a covenant with death and agreement with hell that he would burn, uh, burn publicly. But other abolitionists like Frederick Douglass disagreed. Um, Douglass believed that the original constitution, if read properly, tilted towards freedom, um, not towards slavery. And he rejected the Supreme Court's opinion in Dred Scott that denied citizenship to black Americans. And the Republican party of Abraham Lincoln agreed with Douglass. And following the Civil War, they drafted three amendments that enforced the fundamental uh, principles of American citizenship and individual freedom, which we know as the 13th Amendment, which abolishes slavery, 14th Amendment, which defines the rights of national citizenship, and the 15th Amendment uh, that declares that no citizen can be denied the right to vote on account of race, color, or, or previous condition of servitude. And the Republicans who drafted and presented those to the people who ratified them believed that these amendments were not revolutionary, they actually strengthened and they furthered the original principles of the Declaration of Independence and the original Bill of Rights. To them, Reconstruction was a, it was a restoration, actually, a restoration of constitutional government and constitutional freedom, which the seceding states had actually, actually betrayed. And as, as, as Wilfred and as Cheryl Lynn has talked about, these, you know, are not enforced in any strengthened way until you get to the, to the 20th century. But notice that when you get to that second reconstruction um, during the civil rights era, it does not involve, I mean, there are some important amendments, the poll tax amendment, extending the right to vote, there are important amendments there. But what we think of, of the civil rights era and the key moments and events and texts of the civil rights era are not con new constitutional texts, but they are Supreme Court opinions like Brown v. Board of Education, Loving against, uh, against Virginia, and the 64 Civil Rights Act, and the 65 Voting Rights Act, and the 68 uh, Fair Housing Act. These are the texts, but all of those texts and all of those cases are based on the powers given to the federal government and the rights enshrined in the Constitution at the first Reconstruction. So even these later Reconstructions themselves echo back, echo back to earlier moments and earlier assertions of who we are as an American people. And we are still finding better ways to enforce them to this day. Thank you very much for that. Uh, Professor Coddington, in the wonderful conversation that your article just inspired among your colleagues, many fascinating themes emerged, including the idea that a reconstruction is not a binary thing. It's not just a series of constitutional amendments and subsequent reconstructions involved a series of activities, including executive orders, uh, landmark Supreme Court decisions, as well as statutes um, that were designed to fulfill the promise of the first reconstruction. 
So I'd like to ask you in light of, to reflect on all you've heard and to tell us in light of all this, what would a third reconstruction look like? Uh, and to be concrete, uh, there's a bill pending before the House, uh, uh, the, the voting rights bill that would represent a, 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 the most meaningful federal voting rights bill since the Voting Rights Act of 1965, if it passed. If that were to pass, um, would that count as a third reconstruction? And what, what else, what other sort of landmark federal legislation or judicial opinions or executive orders do you think and do you recommend uh, to constitute a third reconstruction? Sure. So I, um, I, I love listening to this uh, panel of scholars. They're so engaging. Dr. Allen, um, so correct to say that it is about continuity and nothing springs from nothing, right? Like this was a, a, a decades long movement occurring and there were, there were movements and counter movements that sort of resulted in this spark that could occur during the recon, what we have come to call the reconstruction era. And um, Professor, Pro Professor Eiffel, who I think has stated we could be, we very well be in that third reconstruction era right now. Right, like we, we, we very well may be seeing, we've seen the seeds sowed, but we may be um, sort of cultivating them right now. And, and thank you, uh, Professor Lash for talking about the parallels and, and the sort of non-parallels between the two. Um, and, and so I do think, yeah, you know, there's some important legislation before Congress right now that's languishing. We have a range of, um, Legislation that could be just called pro-democracy legislation. There's the For People, the For the People Act, right? And this would uh, do a range of things to expand access to voting. It would also get rid of partisan manipulation in uh, drawing the lines that we are importantly doing pretty soon now that the census numbers are out. There is the John Lewis uh, Restoration of the Voting Rights Act, which was, you know, doing the work to, to fix what the court actually broke in 2013 in the Shelby County decision. There's statehood for DC that is pending right now. And I think that that is one of the unstated injustices where you have over 700,000 people in a, a federal, what do we call it, colony, um, where they don't have representation in the very institutions of democracy in their backyard. So there are a range of uh, pieces of legislation that are in Congress right now and could um, propel us further into the reconstruction if we actually are there right now. But it's not only about these pieces of legislation. It is also about um, the reforms that needs to take place at the state and local level too, right? So most policing, we, we, we talk about the, the George Floyd Justice Act. The president has mentioned that, the vice president has introduced, she's been a, a co-sponsor on that important piece. Most of policing occurs at the state and local level though, right? So, and, and we're seeing these movements that again, Professor Eiffel mentioned, you know, this was starting back in 2012 with the slaying of Trayvon Martin and continuing onward. Um, we're seeing this sort of groundswell of activity and those are important uh, elements that were there in the previous reconstruction. Obviously we had the civil rights movement, which was the second, Reconstruction era, and then we had the abolitionist movement, and it continued into other movements, right? Um, Frederick Douglass uh, cautioned uh, Garrison about closing down the anti-slavery society too early because even though the 13th Amendment had been adopted, the work, the important work to make people full citizens was not done. Right, so um, this, this, this important movement going on to push government at all levels, not just at the federal level, because so much is done at other levels, uh, is, is going to be an important part of this reconstruction. And I think what we're seeing now too is um, with this president pushing a big, bold economic agenda, which is the sort of unspoken part of reconstructions, right? Like we have seen before where there was an investment to make sure that these rights aren't hollow rights, that it is not worth having um, the, the, the idea or the label of uh, equality if you can't actually 
uh, pay, get something equally. If you can't pay for your rent, if you can't pay for food, if you're, if you're struggling to think about how you're going to pay for your kid's education, those sorts of things are really fundamental to, to ensure that the promise and, and the progress that we want to see in reconstruction actually becomes a reality. So there are very, uh, a number of facets that we need to be looking at. I think all the stuff at the federal level is very important, but we need to be looking from top to bottom and all the way across. Thank you very much for that. Uh, Professor Allen, you've just heard Professor Coddington give a series of examples of uh, federal, state, and judicial actions that he think might qualify for a, another reconstruction, ranging from the Voting Rights Legislation, the For the People Act, the John Lewis Act, uh, state and local police reform, and judicial opinions, as well as President Biden's economic proposals without expressing an opinion about all those, do you agree broadly that, the, that those uh, kinds of federal, state, and uh, economic legislation uh, are desirable uh, to fulfill the promise of the first reconstruction? Uh, and if not, are there any other laws, policies, or changes in practices that you think would better uh, achieve that promise? Well, to, to add to you specifically, Jeff, I do not agree that that's desirable but it's not a question of whether the goals and vision are desirable. It's a question of whether we have a fit understanding of what it is we're proposing and how we propose to accomplish it. Extending over broadly the implications of, call it reconstruction to speak loosely, only invites pipe dreams about social coordination. And pipe dreams about social coordination miss the whole point of this historical movement because it doesn't solve the problem of how you direct the coordinating authority. This movement begins with the concern of what is the coordinating authority and how can it be brought under control? Remember, we have always interpreted reconstruction as aimed at the South. Our conversation makes clear that that was a mistake from the beginning and it certainly is no longer aimed just at the South. But it's really important to understand why it was thought to be something aimed at the South. That was a misconstruction that evaded the reality that the whole series of efforts that undermined the status of black people in the United States were taking place in the North. Yes, after the war, with the counter reaction from the former slave masters, there was a period certainly that became ugly, terroristic and otherwise, but long before that, it was Ohio, Illinois, it was Missouri, it was Oregon, it was places throughout the North that were multiplying black codes. And so the real question was the question Stephen A. Douglas raised in 1854. Is popular sovereignty good enough to solve this problem? He answered yes. Very important people said no. There must be rights beyond the reach of popular sovereignty. But what are we witnessing now when we go through the litany of possibilities that Professor Coddington is talking about? We're merging back into a pop soft defense. We might as well be adopting Stephen A. Douglas, say, as long as we can mature the dynamic political forces so that we can drive a majority, then it doesn't really matter what the coordinating social authority is or what its powers are or whether they can be limited. Well, our real danger, our real game here is to figure out how to arrive at national standards of performance while nevertheless yielding to the local authority to perform. And that's a specific accomplishment in statecraft, in judicial craft, in constitution making. That's beyond policy implications for this or that particular, particular form of relief. And so the real thinking that's necessary is how do you achieve that constitutional balance? That's what's important. Now, whether that will fulfill the dreams of reconstruction is a secondary question from my perspective. So I don't rule out people wanting to get to a new place with regard to various social dynamics. I think that's very important. I happen to think it's more important how you get there. I think that's the critical question. Otherwise, you're actually wandering aimlessly as I see it. Fascinating. Thank you so much for that. Uh, Cheryl and Eiffel, what do you think of uh, Professor Allen's uh, provocative suggestion that what is needed is a process or a dynamic for agreeing on national standards that would 
uh, allow coordination and implementation to be to take place at the state level, and then tell us what you what roadmap you would suggest for uh, the reconstruction. Uh, you have endorsed a series of federal, state, local, and normative changes. Map out for us what the reconstruction would look like in, in, in your view. Well, yeah. Well, first, in response to Professor Allen, I, I sincerely hope that he and I can continue this conversation offline because I think the project that he has suggested is powerful, ambitious, and important, and one I think this country is not up to at this moment. <laughs> and I am, uh, and I fear, right, that uh, we are very near the abyss of losing what would be the elements that would allow us to even have that rational engagement and conversation that he correctly identifies is actually desperately needed. And so perhaps I'm in a, a more um, emergency mode uh, and, in a, and in a more short-term uh, vision of what that reconstruction looks like to get us to a place where we have the stability to engage what I think are the very, very important um, and really illuminating questions and the analysis that Professor uh, Allen is providing. Uh, what is interesting to me about this moment, and it was true in the uh, second reconstruction as well, but I think can be powerfully seen right now, is the crossing of the streams uh, between two fundamental issues uh, in the construction of the American body politic. One of them, of course, is about race and about racial exclusion. The other is about power and the relationship between power in rural areas and urban areas. And we are now at a moment where the streams are so effectively crossed that the solutions, that the fundamental reordering will actually be relevant to both of those questions. And so while obviously, as you know, I am a big supporter of the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act and the For the People Act and the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act. Um, each of those builds on what Professor Lash currently, I, you know, correctly identifies as existing constitutional provisions. The For the People Act is, is more um, of an elections based on the elections clause. But if we think about some of the civil rights statutory framework that I think needs to be reinvigorated, it's just really once again, uh, asking Congress or demanding that Congress respond to the architecture that the framers of the Civil War Amendments created, which was that they propped open the door with the enforcement clauses, which is to say, we don't know what else is going to happen, but we suspect things may happen. And so we are going to give you this power to enforce the, the guarantees that are articulated in these amendments. And so when we talk about civil rights statutes, either during the civil rights movement or even now, we're actually not asking Congress to create something new out of whole cloth. We're asking them to walk firmly in the center of the enforcement power that they were given uh, for reason by the, the framers of the Civil War Amendments. And one could include almost all of that. We think about policing and the origins of policing with slave patrols, and we think about the role that it played uh, in the post-Reconstruction period. If we think about the role that policing and control played throughout the 20th century, we recognize it as a core civil rights issue. Most of the urban unrest in the 1960s came out of uh, some encounters between law enforcement officers and black people in our cities, 150 incidents of urban unrest in the 1960s. And yet we emerged from that decade with three core civil rights statutes, none of which responded to the issue of policing. So it's a core civil rights issue that has to be addressed within the context of the enforcement power of those amendments. But to layer over the other piece about power gets us to the electoral college gets us to the designation of, of senators, you know, by state, regardless of population. It gets us to these other issues about power designation that actually do cross these two elements, the issue of race exclusion and power, the issue of rural urban power and uh, articulation and expression based upon where you live in the country. And I actually think what's been exciting at this moment is people beginning to see the relationship between those two things, beginning to see that we are still struggling with the inequities around the rural urban divide. We did some of that during the civil rights movement too, the whole one person, one vote, uh, striking down the county unit system, right? All of these systems that were in place, particularly in the South to give more power to the rural areas. This is a conversation we actually need to engage more vigorously as well, because it is also about the ordering of power and it has deep implications 
uh, for race and the stability of this country going forward. So I'd love to see those streams cross in our dialogue. Uh, and in some way, the For the People Act tries to do that. Uh, but I think we haven't had rich enough conversations about the relationships between those two and the need to find solutions that are um, responsive to the ways in which both of those elements implicate stability and power in this country. Thank you so much for that. Uh, Professor Lash, at this point in this fascinating discussion, uh, uh, Sherilyn Eiffel has just uh, expressed uh, interest and respect in, in Professor Allen's suggestion that we have a sort of thoughtful dialogue about the balance between uh, national and, and state power, but uh, is more skeptical that that sort of thoughtful conversation is possible without constitutional level reform, given structures like the Electoral College and other uh, forms of distribution of power between urban and rural areas that make um, coordination difficult. What does history teach us about the conversation that Cheryl and Eiffel and Professor Allen are having? And how successful were the first and second reconstructions, if you want to call them that, in achieving the coordination that uh, everyone seems to agree is, is helpful? It's, thank you. Yeah, the, the idea of, of where to center the power to effectuate the, uh, the reforms or the, or the reconstruction is always a part, always a part of the base. Um, and the, the arguments over federalism, of course, were a, a major part of antebellum debates. Interestingly enough, it was um, the slaveholding states in the South that wanted to use national power um, to take a slavery north into the, into the free states. And it was the abolitionist states, whether it's Wisconsin or, or Massachusetts, who stressed the founding ideal of federalism that protected their right to oppose slavery and protected their right to protect their black citizens. Um, from any um, abuses of power coming from, from the federal government. So it's, and then once you get into, into reconstruction it, itself, you had, you had radical Republicans who wanted to do away with uh, general notions of dual federalism, but you had mainstream Republicans who actually continued to believe that that type of dispersion of power uh, was extremely important. And they insisted on following the dual federalist approach um, to constitutional reform. So, but it's always, so it's debated and of course, it, Federalism today is debated, whether we should still have this type of dual system, whether we should still uh, uh, have a Senate um, made up of states with equal representation in the Senate, regardless, regardless of population. We're still arguing over whether centralization or decentralization or some type of balance between the two um, is the most appropriate way to effectuate the principles of the founding upon which we all agree. And, th and that is what I find really remarkable about our conversation today is so much, um, so much of it is based upon principles which are in the Constitution, which are already declared in our fundamental documents, already declared, whether in the Declaration of Independence and the, the principles of equality there, or whether um, how those principles became instantiated through the 13th, 14th, and 15th, 15th Amendments. There's this, there's this aspect to American Reconstructions that is always backwards looking, backwards looking in the sense of calling us to first principles. This is, this is Dr. King, right? In his I have a, I have a dream speech, which he, which he gives in front of Abraham Lincoln, right? Um, there at the Lincoln Memorial. And he invokes um, the visions of the architects of our Republic who wrote the magnificent words of the constitution and the declaration of independence. It's this calling back, it's this calling back to find new ways um, to further principles upon which we all agree. And that's the difficulty, it seems to me, in facing anyone trying to structure a third reconstruction right now, because we're a nation divided, um, obviously. Uh, we're deeply divided along, along political and ideological lines. And, and that divide focuses on very different ideas. You have one side that tends to focus on, on, on principles of, of equality, and political participation and, and federal investment in equality and, and uh, political participation. You have another side that is focused on the abuses of government power and concerns about coerced ideological conformity and excessive government power and concerns about liberty as opposed to equality. And so those two, these are both deeply rooted in the reconstruction amendments themselves, principles of equality and principles of liberty. But in many ways, they're in tension. They're in tension with each other. And Jeff, I'd, you have often 
referred to constitutional guardrails. I think I've heard you talk about that in the past. Rather than thinking in terms of a third reconstruction, I have found myself more and more thinking about your insight into constitutional guardrails and maintaining a tension um, between equality and, and liberty, because those two held in balance, I think, um, present a possibility for forward movement that, in, that can include the broad body, uh, broad body politic. Um, whether we need a third reconstruction or simply a furthering of what we have, that's, that's the debate we're having. Thank you very much for that, Kurt. Uh, the guardrails idea is certainly not uh, mine, but the Constitution Center does have an exciting initiative uh, exploring uh, how to resurrect the guardrails of democracy and convening uh, scholars and thought leaders of different perspectives to propose reforms to resurrect those guardrails. So at the end of our conversation, which will happen by 1.45, just so everyone expects it, I'm gonna ask each of you to propose one guardrail for equality or democracy that you would propose. Um, but before we do that, we have one, we have time for one last round and just this wonderful uh, substantive discussion. And Professor Connington, I'm going to ask you to pick up on uh, Professor Lash's suggestion that there's a tension in this country between an emphasis on liberty and equality and ask you to reflect, how is that playing out on the, on the courts? And just to put the uh, question this way, the first reconstruction, uh, many agree, was thwarted by the Supreme Court, as well as by Southern Redemption, which struck down the Civil Rights Act of 1875, which upheld segregation and which thwarted the promise of the amendment. Uh, this, the second reconstruction, you have argued, uh, was for a time fulfilled by the convergence of uh, the Warren Court and landmark decisions, the cooperation of the presidency and the active participation of Congress. Now, as Professor Lash says, we have a division on the current Supreme Court between the meaning of the Equal Protection Clause itself. Is, is it colorblind and focused more on individual equal liberty? Or uh, is it uh, devoted more toward uh, equity and equal opportunity and remedying past uh, discrimination? Uh, talk about that division. What role, in your view, sh would the courts have to play if the third reconstruction that you're arguing is to come to pass, and how do you see the relationship between the courts, Congress, and the presidency moving forward? Sure, and I, I just wanna quickly pick up on what Professor Eiffel said. She talked about this uh, convergence of race and power, which I just think is so profound and so accurate. And she mentioned the Electoral College, which I've also written an article for, for the Atlantic and National Constitution Center. I think that uh, the Electoral College is and always just has been one of these uh, repudiations of actual democracy and, and the will of the people, right? And, and so even what occurred in January, at January 6th, you know, like that would not have been able to occur without the whole processes that the Electoral College sets into pace to occur, right? You had to have this formal counting and all this other stuff. So um, that working in concert with the Senate gives us a Supreme Court that actually is less reflective of what the American people want and look like. And, and so that brings me to your point, what, what we should expect from the Supreme Court. Um, you know, after the first after the first reconstruction, we had a series of cases, your slaughterhouse case that um, gutted the privileges or immunities clause. We had the civil rights uh, cases, which created the state action doctrine and, and gutted the Civil Rights Act. We had Plessy, which sanctioned uh, racial apartheid in America for for the foreseeable future. Um, we saw something similar to that. And so while we had a liberal war in court working in concert with Congress and the president during the 50s and the 60s, we saw shortly after that a series of cases that showed that the war in court was gone. We quickly had Washington versus Davis, which basically said, you know, your disparate impact is not enough to show uh, that there is discrimination going on. You had uh, the Regents of California versus Baki, which put out this idea of a colorblind constitution in higher education and admissions, this idea of colorblindness, which went back to Harlan's dissent in Plessy, but his was more a different take on it, right? Like saying that, 
you know, we have this ideal of colorblindness. And here in Regents, we, we saw Justice Powell saying the Constitution is inherently colorblind, and that's how we'll continue this, uh, this progeny of cases. And then we saw the city of Mobile uh, versus Bolden, which basically put those two ideas into the, uh, the, the democratic system, right? So this idea that you need to show intent and, and, and disproportionate impact and election discrimination wasn't enough. Um, and, and this idea that we have this colorblindness that is going to rule the day. So what we see now is we have um, the, the convergence of the Electoral College and the Senate giving us an extremely uh, revanchionist Supreme Court right now that seeks to prioritize certain values, uh, values that they think the American people um, should be embracing. And one of those values I, I fear is just not equality, right? Maybe it's liberty, certain types of liberty. There's corporate liberty that they seem to embrace, which is a, a bizarre uh, twist on the 14th Amendment's liberty of due process clause. Uh, there's religious liberties of some religions um, seem to get priority over others, but I don't I don't think that the ideas uh, of certainly racial um, or, or liberty um, for other people to uh, prosper, the sort of liberties that you need to um, be able to um, have to actually have a prosperous life. And certainly, as I said, equality is, is sort of just not even in the picture anymore. We see that in racial equality. We don't see it in our policing. We don't see it in education. Wealth was off the table during the 70s as a protected class. Um, so I, I do think we are seeing um, certain things prioritized by the Supreme Court. It is unlike um, what we've seen in some time. And I, I fear that if we don't see actual constitutional reforms, actual uh, constitutional guardrails, as Professor Lass said, it, 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 it gets worse before it can get better. Thank you very much for that. Uh, Professor Allen, you have written powerfully about the colorblindness ideal as a constitutional ideal. Um, uh, and, ex and expressed uh, uh, sympathy for it. Um, if the Supreme Court uh, were to continue to embrace uh, colorblindness as an ideal in cases ranging from voting rights cases to affirmative action cases, would that, in your view, represent a fulfillment or a thwarting of the promise of the third or continuation of the first reconstruction? And given the, the strong division of uh, opinion about what the Constitution means when it comes to colorblindness and equality, uh, do, does that make you optimistic or pessimistic about hopes for the kind of reason federal state dialogue that you suggested? Well, I must say that your, your question provides the answer immediately, namely that today's opinion does not forecast tomorrow's opinion. <laughs> so even if one embraced a robust notion of colorblindness today, it doesn't indicate how one will interpret it tomorrow. Uh, even if one embraces a robust notion of democracy today, it doesn't forecast how one will interpret it tomorrow. And you see this operatively in this discussion of the Electoral College. To, to the, dismiss the Electoral College as a static expression of racist or undemocratic intention is to fail, as I see it, to understand how it came to be and the role it has played. It has had a historical significance quite apart from its origination. And to interpret it properly, one has to be able to distinguish those things and ask, okay, let's assume for a moment that whatever was intended when the Electoral College was drafted in the Constitution, must we not ask the question, what were the outcomes and consequences of it? And scholarship has shown for a very long time, of course, that many of those outcomes and consequences had no relationship to the intention of the people who drafted that provision, as for example, the necessity of the two-party system. So, so that we have a tendency to glibness, we, all of us, that's an academic liability, that misleads us often. Uh, we forget, for example, just to go back to our broader conversation, that in 1783, the original three-fifths clause had specific notice of the existence of other free citizens in the United States, excluding Indians not taxed. Those were Black people. So the original three-fifths clause recognized Black people as fully human and free, and therefore also indicated the nature of the problem for the next 250 to 300 years. What are we going to do with them? How are we going to absorb them? 
That has been our dilemma from the beginning, and it is a continuing dilemma. And that dilemma is not resolved unless we can say to ourselves, you know, not only what spare structural, institutional, or legal provisions we can dream up, but we also know what's actually happening to people. Now, let me illustrate that for you, because that seems to be is more important than anything else we've discussed. Between 1860 and 1890, the Black population in the United States doubled. In that 30 years, following the end of slavery, the population doubled. Had it continued to increase at that rate, it would be three and a half to five times its present size in the United States. So what is the concrete reality that that portrays for? It portrays that those systemic or structural features that people so often talk about had their impact at a very early stage on diminishing the political significance of the population in the country. It wasn't so much the health concerns or the environmental concerns, it was that there, there was a trajectory there that was simply incredible in human history and was not characteristic of any other element of the population that would have assured, for example, that Black people would remain for a long time to come the largest minority in the country, but for the onrush of immigration. And even then, maybe still so. So, so we've seen dynamic changes take place on the ground. We see, first of all, the resilience, and the resourcefulness of that immediate population that exited slavery. They didn't double by just sitting around doing nothing. <laughs> they, they, they doubled because there was energy, intelligence, and exertion among them, uh, a coping under difficult circumstances. And unless we have the ability to understand how people can cope and survive, no matter their circumstances, we cannot help them, period. There is no legal provision. There is no structural provision. There is nothing that doesn't begin with recognizing the intrinsic resourcefulness of people, that sense of agency, which will take control of their lives and also drive the larger framework as long as they're not being oppressed by abstract interventions that undercut. And those abstract interventions are both benign and malign. It's Jim Crow and I suppose Jimmy Eagle, if I'm to quote the president. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you for that. Uh, Cheryl and Eiffel, your response to another very uh, uh, powerful comment of Professor Allen that uh, democracy and agency is as important as law and policy in fulfilling the promise of equality. And then your reflections about, given the strong division of constitutional visions on the Supreme Court, uh, is it possible in practice that uh, the third reconstruction that you envision might come to pass or might, might the kind of laws that you're arguing be, for, uh, be, be struck down or narrowed by the, by the US Supreme Court? So I first wanna um, say how uh, taken aback I was first by William's recitation of precisely what, what happened to the, to the Civil War amendments as he walked through the you know, civil rights cases and slaughterhouse and so on and so forth. Uh, which I try not to th get, think about all at once, just so I won't be depressed and can continue to do my job. Uh, but, but it was important for him to set that forth uh, because I do think, and I've been talking about this a lot lately, it's kind of, it, and I'm, I suppose we don't do it because it's so hard for us to get our hands around it. The project of pushback against full citizenship and dignity for black people is a powerful, heavy, decades long, centuries long project there's a lot of resources that are brought to bear to fulfill that project. And we, um, at our peril, we underestimate. I mean, it's not just a bunch of haphazard things happening. And when William describes the march, you know, how, how we end up not, you know, privileges and immunities, nope, you know, all of a sudden there's state action. Like all of these elements are brought to bear to diminish what is this infrastructure or this architecture of the Civil War amendments that suggests that full citizenship is possible for black people living in this country. So I just wanna first say that because that's really important. The second thing is about uh, what William Allen just said about resilience. And I just wanna, I'm not gonna spend a bunch of time on it. I'll just say uh, that you, you confirmed for me my own, my own curriculum uh, because beginning, I guess, four years ago, um, when I had a conversation with Isabel Wilkerson right after the 2016 election, about a week later, we were doing an event at the University of Maryland along with Taylor Branch, the great civil rights historian. Uh, 
And she told me then, and I was trying to sound very hopeful because that's my job. And, uh, and she told me then that she thought we were entering the nadir or the nadir. And I believed her, but I pretended like I didn't because I just couldn't, I couldn't accept it. But what I did do to hedge against the possibility that she was right is that I began a kind of curriculum for myself, uh, studying the nadir to understand what did black people do in this period of tremendous oppression and pushback, this is post-slavery, this is, you know, early, early 20th century, you know, 1890s to 1920s or 30s. What did we do during the Nadir? That's the course of study I've been on actually for the past few years. And so I read all kinds of books and all kinds of accounts. And I and that's a different conversation that we could have about what I learned about what I think, and it guides some of what I'm doing now around how do you ensure the resilience of people to be able to withstand the, that the bets that you're making on constitutional and statutory and civil rights change don't come to pass because the people still have to be able to survive and be resilient. And so that's always part of my mind too. And one of the projects we have at LDF is called Strengthening African-American Communities. And we devote litigation work to housing and to education uh, and to employment and to transportation, all thinking about how do we shore up and ensure the integrity and the ability of black communities to sustain themselves, whatever the headwinds that are happening around. So that's part of our work. But to really answer your question, um, Jeff, you know, do I think it's possible? I actually don't think we have a choice. The one thing that gets both feet on the floor every morning is that I think we are at such a, a broken place, at such a space of um, potential devastation as a democracy. We are so vulnerable that we have no choice. The, the only question is whether it will be as robust as it needs to be. You know, it's like a stimulus package, right? Is it skinny stimulus or is it, you know, the stimulus you really need? The only question is to me the scope of it because it actually must happen. And if it doesn't happen, the alternative is that we end up in a place where it cannot happen for some time to come and where democracy itself is in peril. So I actually believe that we actually must make the elements of this new engaged period reconstruction happen because we have our backs literally against the wall. And I just wanna add in Jeff that we can't forget two elements that are the, 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 the poison pills, one of which existed in both the first reconstruction and the second reconstruction, and that is violence. That is violence against those trying to make that change happen, violence in resistance to the, to the uh, principles of equality, violence in response to the principles of democracy and so forth. And that exists again today. But the new poison pill, the new poison pill is what the online platforms have provided. And so I say this as a way of also kind of just ask, answering your constitutional guardrails question, which is the unchecked and untrammeled introduction of an entirely different world, a constructed reality without regulation, uh, capable of, of spreading misinformation, capable of sowing violence, capable of sowing discord, capable of constructing a world that feels real to the people who are in it, is something that we obviously didn't have in the first or second reconstruction and that we haven't confronted as a democracy yet. And yet it is a poison pill that can undermine any project that any of us have suggested might be before us in this coming period. And so I think this is something we must grapple with. As I have said directly to Mark Zuckerberg uh, and to Sheryl Sandberg and to others uh, in this space, every public space in this country has been contested and you cannot create a virtual public space and think it will not be contested in the same ways, contested around race, con contested around belonging, uh, uh, contested around safety, uh, contested around women, all of that. And we see it playing out on these platforms. And so we, it's time for us to bring that public space into the dialogue, into the discord, into the discourse, into the infrastructure that we created to address the reality of inequality in the, public, in the physical public space. Um, and so I just think that's something, a project that's before us and we cannot pretend that it is unrelated 
to these vital questions of democracy. Thank you so much for that uh, rich answer. Thanks for sharing your reading uh, and your, your uh, learnings. And I will uh, ask you to maybe share some of those with our friends so we can add some of those primary sources to our new um, uh, founders and second founders library. And thanks also for suggesting a guardrail. And you did indeed in 2019 in the Washington Post write a piece saying that uh, Mark Zuckerberg doesn't know his civil rights history and that some willingness to address the question of online speech was necessary for achieving the promise of equality. All right, we have five minutes left and Constitution Center programs like Supreme Court arguments always end on time. So I'm gonna ask each of you now to just in a sentence or two, if you had to uh, offer uh, a single guardrail for democracy to fulfill the promise of the constitution uh, of liberty, equality, and deliberation, what would it be? Professor Lash, I know you didn't have a chance for a full response to everyone else, so you can have maybe another beat if you would like, uh, but let's try to keep to our five minutes. And, and after a, a quick response to the very rich comments you have just heard, please give us your guardrail of democracy. Thank you. Um, this has been wonderful, a great, a great conversation. Um, I, I think I can answer that fairly, fairly briefly if I can push the metaphor just a little bit and repeat what I said before. Um, I would just pluralize guardrail into guardrails. Uh, we believe in separation of powers. That's uh, one of the constitutional innovations that you get under the American Constitution. We divide power between the three national branches of government and between the national and state governments. And you do that the better to secure liberty the innovation to prevent any one institution from becoming uh, too powerful and creating a form of tyranny. I think we should also think about um, balance of rights and, and preserve and pursue and advance both equality and liberty and refuse to give up either one. I think it is out of that maintained balance of those guardrails um, that, that liberty and equality will both best flourish. Thank you so much for that uh, concise and eloquent uh, proposal. Professor Coddington, please share with our friends uh, your proposed guardrail of democracy. Sure, uh, so I think just the guardrail of democracy is actually investing in democracy. And I think all too often we've seen that there, we, that just doesn't happen, right? So where you see long lines of people uh, standing to actually exercise their right to vote, where you see machine breakdowns, where you see um, this sort of backlash of voter suppression laws, right? Um, the organization I'm affiliated with counted over 340 um, just in the, the beginning of this year, right? Related to um, restricting the right to vote um, through whether absentee ballots or drop boxes that became so essential during the pandemic. So I think we need to invest in democracy. I'd like to just add to that. I'd like to see something done about the electoral college and potentially an affirmative right to vote in our constitution. We only protect the right to vote through anti-discrimination provisions and there is no actual positive right to vote in the constitution. Thank you very much for that. Uh, Professor Allen, your guardrail for democracy. I think you're on mute. Oh, oh, sorry, yeah, 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 yeah sorry. That's, uh, sorry, that, that was one time I forgot to unmute. I said, I will return to colorblindness. Uh, I will define it, however, in a way that you may not be accustomed to. I would call it the ability to see color without seeing a problem in color, which I illustrate by referring you to Holland's dissent in Plessy versus Ferguson, he introduced the term colorblindness, but went on to write an opinion in which he used frequently the term black to describe black people rather than the colloquial colored as a, an illustration of what he meant by colorblindness, which has not been sufficiently observed in most commentary since that time. Thank you very much for that. And Sherilyn Eiffel, last word to you. You've given us one guardrail. Uh, uh, Please suggest another and, and some final thoughts for our audience. Uh, yeah, I just have to return again to you know the two things: the system of voting um, that allows people to have a voice in uh, you know those who who control their lives. The entire civil rights movement around voting was premised on the belief uh, by those activists that 
through voting, they could change the material condition of their lives. It was not just supposed to be ceremonial, a ceremonial expression of citizenship. Uh, and so when we uh, allow voter suppression to, to run rampant, we are removing from people the belief that they can change the material condition of their lives. And then lastly, there is nothing more, um, more reflective of your lack of citizenship than the fact that you can be vulnerable to the violence of the state without recourse. And that means that the issue of police violence against unarmed African-Americans has to be addressed. And the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act is just the first step, just one step. It's a multi-layered approach that has to happen at the national and at the state level. I've been very encouraged to see the reinvigorated Department of Justice deciding that it's going to uh, re-engage around the issues of unconstitutional policing. But uh, it's simply not possible to regard yourself as a citizen if the state can commit violence against you with impunity. Thank you so much, Wilfred Coddington, William Allen, Sherilyn Eiffel, and Kurt Lash for an extraordinarily illuminating, thoughtful, deep, and productive conversation about uh, whether we should have a third reconstruction. You have given us hope that these kind of civil constitutional conversations can indeed spread light, and we will do our part at the Constitution Center by continuing to convene them. Thanks to you, friends, for tuning in and devoting more than an hour of your days to educating yourself about the Constitution, and look forward to seeing all of you again uh, soon for another America's Town Hall. Thanks, everyone.